You can probably think back to a time in your life when you had a bad week. Maybe it was this past week, I don't know, but all of us have a bad week from now and then. But I want you to think back to the first century as those closest disciples of Jesus had maybe what they thought was going to be the worst week of their life, right? They've been following Jesus during his earthly ministry for some three years, maybe a little longer, and things were going pretty well. Jesus was performing some incredible miracles and doing some amazing teaching that was something that, you know, the crowds hadn't heard before, or at least hadn't had explained in the way Jesus was explaining it. But as time got further along in Jesus' ministry, things got tougher, and there's, you know, they were starting to see some things that concerned them. Jesus was getting under the skin in a very real way among the religious leadership of the day, and, and that meant trouble. The disciples could see trouble coming for Jesus, and, and uh, Jesus, for his part, was trying to prepare them for his coming death. And he would mention it from time to time, but yet it just didn't seem to be sinking in. And it's easy for us to look back at this distance and say, well, why didn't those people get it? You know, Jesus was saying that he would rise from the dead, but I reflect a little more soberly on those things. I'm guessing if I'd have been among that group, I probably would have been the same way. Surely someone who can do the miracles Jesus did would never be put to death. But anyway, the, the time kind of finally came. Jesus said, I'm going away. I'm going to send the helper. And again, it just wasn't sinking in until it actually happened. Jesus, before the very eyes of the disciples, was crucified. A horrible, painful death. As the day dawned on that particular Sunday at the beginning of a new week in the first century, the world of Jesus' disciples lay shattered around their feet, right? They pinned their hopes on this Messiah, the one they believed to be the Messiah with all of their hearts. And yet there he was dead and been put in a tomb. The crucifixion perhaps had dashed their hopes of kingdom renewal. They're huddled together fearing for their own life at this point. But Sunday dawns, a group of women disciples sadly made their way back to the tomb to give the body of Jesus a proper burial. You know, things happen pretty quick around Passover there, so they're going back on Sunday morning early to kind of take care of things that they couldn't take care of earlier. But they encounter on that morning something they never expected. Let me read for you again the words of Luke 24, verses 1 through 6. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And at that point, probably what the thought that came to their mind, well, how much worse can it get? Somebody stole the body, took the body. Where is it gone? What further indignity could they show to their Lord? While they were perplexed about this, it says, Behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing, and as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He's not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee? I love that phrase. These men, as the New American Standard says, are obviously heavenly messengers in dazzling clothing. That's how they appear most often in Scripture. Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He's not here. Again, thoughts flooding their mind. What's going on here? Maybe starting things starting to dawn on them, putting the puzzle pieces together. And what's going on? You see, the tomb, according to these angelic messengers, was the wrong place to look for the risen Lord. There's no tomb strong enough to restrain the resurrection power of God. Amen. Can't build a tomb secure enough to hold Jesus. But these followers of Christ, just like the rest, again, at one point thought it was all over. In spite of the words of Jesus, promising he would rise again. Can we really believe it? Who could? They'd seen the miracle work raise others from the dead, but how do you raise yourself? From the dead. 
After all, some had witnessed his death and relayed that the news on to the rest. That's why they go to the tomb in the first place to seek his body. The tombs of the dead are not the place to find the Lord of life. He had risen from the dead, and his conquering death means that he is the source of life, true life. If we're to find true life for ourselves today, a long time after the, the fact, we must seek the risen Lord Amen. and encourage others to seek him. That's the only place you're going to find true life. You see, the problem is, that's a pretty simple message, right? Jesus rose from the dead. And you want to have resurrection life, you need to be in him. You need to have faith in Christ. Pretty simple message. Most people can parse that out, understand it. But the problem is there are many counterfeits out there claiming to be the source of life. That's the issue, right? There's a lot of other enticing things in the world that promise life. These counterfeits are presented in a, as attractive alternatives to the life of Christ that he offers, or in some cases, even try to be mixed in with the life that Christ offers. And that maybe even is more deadly. They don't come across as maybe specific, you know, say, well, Life is here rather than Christ. It's even more insidious to say, well, Christ plus this. However it plays out, though, true life is, you got to watch out for, for the frauds. Amen. You know, we live in a world, you know, most of us have computers now or phones like computers, and there's scam artists out there, right? Well, there's scam artists in the spiritual realm who are those who oppose Christ are pretty good at at uh, scamming us. We're going to look at some of those this morning. Let's expose these counterfeit sources of life to the lies that they really are. If you pay attention to the world around you, you'll hear often that life is found in pleasure. Hey, we all like pleasure. You like doing pleasurable things. I do too. And in and of themselves, that's okay. You know, life isn't meant to all be a drudgery. But is that where true life is found? You know, it's the old philosophy. The Bible describes it this way. You know, eat, drink, and be merry. You know, there's something that'll preach. In today's world, probably every century in times past. Eat, drink, and be merry. This is the idea that the pursuit of pleasure is the highest good. I will seek to find meaning in life by indulging myself, refusing to deny myself anything. There was ever a philosophy that has seduced a large section of our world. This would be it. Eat, drink, and be merry. That's where that's really living, according to the world we live in. But there's a rub. What does the Bible say about that? Well, it says things like what we read in Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Rather than trusting in the cross of Christ. Those who live to satisfy their appetites oppose the cross. But listen to the Apostle Paul. He says, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. And the idea here of walking is just the way you choose to live your life. Paul says, I've set an example for you. He'll say in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, I believe it is, Follow me as I follow Christ. So it isn't Paul setting himself up as the prime example, but as he's walking in Christ, Paul says, follow me, follow others that are walking as God called you to walk. He says, for many walk, Paul says, of whom I often told you, and now I tell you even weeping, that they're enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. And that philosophy of Eat, drink, and be merry is found right there in the middle of those verses in Philippians chapter 3, right? Whose God is their appetite. The older versions, I think, said God is the, their God is their belly. I just want to do what I want to do. I want to feed my pleasures in life. As a specific example of the dangers of this kind of behavior, Paul speaks of some widows in Ephesus who had lost their Christian bearings. Not picking on that particular group, but Paul holds him up as one group that has given themselves over and 
least in some measure to this, and it wouldn't be the only group, but notice what he says. 1 Timothy 5, verses 5 and 6. Now she who is a widow indeed, and who has been left alone, has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers by night and day. But she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. See, that's key to think here. We're talking about philosophies, philosophies of life. Philosophies that we're tempted in our world to try to find true life. Is it pleasure? Want and pleasure? No. Paul says here, you give yourself over to that lifestyle, guess what? You're a walking dead man or a dead woman. You're dead even while you think you're living. One of the signs of a culture in decline is at least partly due to the fact that people become lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. There, Timothy, or Paul writing to Timothy and warning him about how, how difficult it's going to be in the last days. Notice how he describes it. He says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self. He goes on, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, <coughs> unloving. Irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And I find it interesting, he ends that laundry list there with that phrase, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You know, in fact, the only time when eat, drink, and the eat, drink, and be merry philosophy makes sense is if there is no resurrection from the dead. The Bible makes that clear in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 30, verse 32. In a chapter devoted primarily to the resurrection, Paul trying to explain it, notice what he says in verse 32. He says, if from human motives, he says, I fought wild beasts in Ephesus, what does it profit me? Notice this, if the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, and be, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. The only time that living for pleasure turns out to be the right way to live is if you know, this life is all there is. Now, is Jesus against enjoying life? No. Is God against pleasure? No. The Bible itself in John chapter 10, Jesus says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came, Jesus says, that they may have life and have it abundantly. So Jesus is all for pleasure in godly ways. But pleasure is not an end in itself. It is not the driving force in life. True life is not found in pleasure according to scripture. But life is also not, is, sometimes we're tempted to believe that life is found in self-denial. See, here's the other end of the pendulum there, isn't it? We've been talking about Let's live life like we want to do it. I want to have all the pleasure I can indulge myself in. Life is found in pleasure. Sometimes the pendulum swings the other way and says, well, if that's not it, maybe life is found in denying myself. This would be the polar opposite of living for pleasure. It's seeking to find meaning in life through denying myself rather than indulging myself. And that has a ring of truth about it. After all, the Bible does talk a fair amount about self-denial, doesn't it? Yeah. But is it the principle that gives life? Is that what we ought to aim for? If I want life, is this the path I should take? What does the Bible say? You know, you're going to get tired of hearing it, saying that. Because <laughs> we could get up here and talk together all day about what I think it ought to be and what you think it ought to be, but... If, if we believe the Bible is the word of God, then we ought to see what he says about it. Amen. Self-denial without the cross has a veneer of wisdom, but underneath all of the austerity, all of, underneath all the self-denial lies a useless life philosophy. Notice Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. I read these words in Bible class a while ago, but let me do it again. Colossians 2, verses 20 and following. Paul says, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, 
which all refer to things which perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. And in essence, that's that's the catchphrase for the life, seeking life and self-denial. Do not do this, do not do that, do not do the other thing. These matters, Paul says, these are matters, rather, which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion. Catch that? Not God-made religion, self-made religion. And self-abasement and severe treatment of the body. That's Those are the watchwords of self-denial. Paul finishes there in verse 23. He says, but these have no value in selfly indulgence. See, if we're seeking life through self-denial, that's that's taking us down the wrong road as well. The Bible says that such a lifestyle betrays a devilish origin. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. But the Spirit explicitly says that in the later times there some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocating abstaining from foods, which God created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. See, self-denial isn't the answer. It's part. Again, the Bible calls us to self-denial, but it needs to be a godly process. Self-denial though in areas where God has granted liberty can lead to judgmental attitudes that can be damaging to the body of Christ. That's what he says in Romans 14. See, I, I can choose to deny myself of something. That's okay. I can choose to do that. The problem comes is when I start making rules for you. I don't, I'm going to withhold this from me and you need to do it too. You're going to be right with God. See, that's a whole other level. Romans 14, 2 through 4 says, One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt. The one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Once again, though, self-denial is an important part of serving Christ. It was Jesus himself who said in Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, so I need to deny myself. But I don't need to believe that true life is found in my efforts to deny, deny myself. That's found in Christ, the risen Lord. <clears throat> Living for self-denial is not the true source of life, just like living for pleasure wasn't the true source. Here's another one, another fraud alert. Life, we're told that life is found in things. Right? You've seen the bumper sticker, you guys with the most toys or win, as if it's some contest. Is that true? Is true life found in, in things? Materialism is a preoccupation with or an emphasis on material objects, comforts, and considerations. It's often coupled with a disinterest or in or rejection of spiritual, intellectual, or cultural values. That's a fancy definition. You know what materialism is. It's living for things. By all appearances, though, it's a life that plenty of people in our world must subscribe to, right? Everybody's on the, the ladder to success. If you got to climb over somebody to, to get there, so be it. Is that where life is found? Guess what? The Bible addresses it. What does the Bible say? According to Jesus, life isn't to be measured in terms of possessions. That's what he says as he told the, the parable of the rich man in Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. You know the guy who had that problem we wish we could all have. You know, crops were so good, or we could say today, my business was so good, I, don't, I can't find enough banks to put my money in. <laughs> what should I do, he says. Well, I'll build larger barns so I can store all the grain. I, saw, I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods, you have many things laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. See, here's the problem with it. 
trying to find life in things because it leads to that first philosophy we talked about. <laughs> I get, if I can gather enough things, then I can eat, drink, and be merry. Nobody's going to tell me no. What did Jesus tell that, that fellow there in his story? He says, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will have what you prepared? Who's going to get all that stuff in the barns? You go. And they'll probably fight over it, won't they? <laughs> Life... According to Jesus, is it measured in terms of possessions? Sometimes less is more. <clears throat> in fact, that's what you read in the wisdom literature. Less is more. That, that hardly computes today when we hear that, right? How can less be more? But the psalmist in Psalm 37, 16 says, Better is the little of the righteous than the abundance of the many wicked. But oh, the temptation is out there to think, well, if that guy has it all. He must be living right. It's not the measuring stick. Righteousness is. Proverbs 15, 16 says, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. See, materialism is a doomed philosophy. If your life is centered on accumulating things, you will never have enough. You see that played out over and over again. Most of us sit on the sidelines and watch the stories of those who've accumulated so much say that we, we all have things again things aren't the problem it's it's our attitude toward them but uh, in Ecclesiastes 5 verses 10 through 13 the writer of Ecclesiastes was you know, he was talking about a lot of vain and useless things in that, that book but he says he who loves money will not be satisfied with money nor he who loves abundance with its income this too is vanity when the good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to the owners except to look on? The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. There is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded to, by their owner to his hurt. If you like the failed philosophies we've already discussed, failed the fraudulent places we're tempted to find life, true life. The same thing is true here. Materialism has evil roots according to Scripture. 1 Timothy 6, verses 7 through 10. Paul says, For we have brought nothing into this world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and the snare and many foolish and harmful desires was plain plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pain and a grief. But accumulation is not an end to itself. It shouldn't be the driving force in life. Yeah, God knows we need things. And Jesus promised that God would provide the things that we need, Matthew 6. Living for things is not the source of true life. Boy, there's a lot of fraudulent sources out there, isn't there? Here's one more, though. Life is found in rules. Well, here's a popular one in religion. Legalism is a dependence on law-keeping to make one right with God. Trying to find true life in following the rules. This one is really tempting because we're encouraged in the scriptures to be obedient to God, aren't we? Of course, over and over again. There's nothing wrong with being faithfully obedient to God. But when we seek life in our own efforts or ability to keep the commandments of God, we go astray. Again, what does the Bible say? Law-keeping justifies no one. Say it again, law-keeping justifies no one. Seeking to be made righteous makes Christ, seeking to be made righteous by rules and laws makes Christ's sacrifice of no effect. That's what Paul says in Galatians 3, verses 11 through 13. Listen to what it says. Paul says, now, no, that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. For the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, it says he who practices them shall live by them. See, that's the problem with trying to find life in rules. 
you got to keep them all. And then there's a new rule comes along, or somebody makes another rule, and you're consumed by the rules. Christ, he, Paul says, redeemed us from the curse of the law. That's the curse. Having become the curse for us, for it is written, curses everyone who hangs on a tree. No one will be justified by law keeping according to Paul. Seeking to be justified by law keeps us or causes us rather to fall from grace. Later in Galatians chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, notice these words. He says, But I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. And what Paul is dealing with in Galatians is, is those who were saying to the Christians, Well, you have to have Christ and keep the old law with it. He says, You have been severed from Christ. You have fallen from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by rules for law. You have fallen from grace. Self-righteousness, and that's what we're talking about here, in essence. Self-righteousness is a vastly different thing than the righteousness given by God. It's different because self-righteousness comes from within us, not God. Paul talked about it in Philippians 3, verses 8 and 9. He says, more than that, I count all things to be lost. And in this context, Paul has been reflecting on his life before Christ. What a mess he made of that. And he looks back and Paul basically says, that, you know, that's all rubbish, trash, garbage. Uh, even a stronger word than that, probably in the original. But he says, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul then said, you know, I, I finally made it where rules are saving me. No, he says, it's Christ. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law or the rules, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Now, again, we're not saying God doesn't have some rules to live by. But it isn't the rules that save us. It's faith in Christ. Amen. We are certainly to obey Christ. Jesus himself said, Romans, or John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, so, you know, obey Jesus. Do it. Amen. It's what he wants you to do, but don't think that you're going to find your righteousness and justification in the keeping, your ability to keep those rules. Because one thing we learn pretty quick is, you know, you may have a pretty good few days of following the rules, and then you're, you're going to stumble and fall, just like I'm going to. Then what are you going to do? You're going to need a Savior. Rules are not an end in themselves. Rules should not be the driving force in our life. Living for rules is not the true source of life. So why then do we seek to find life in philosophies that just bring death rather than seeking life in a resurrected Lord? Why do we do it? You see, we've learned this morning that unrestricted living doesn't provide life. Only a risen Lord does. Amen. Spiritless self-denial doesn't provide life. Only the risen Lord does. Trusting in material things doesn't provide life. Only the risen Lord does. Finally, keeping a rule, a list of rules doesn't provide life. Only the risen Lord does. True life is only found in Christ. Amen. True life is only found in Christ. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I'm the life. That's John 11. I, Jesus said, John 14, 6. See, I'm winging it here, and it's getting me in trouble. <laughs> John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Pick your chapter in John, you'll find something there about it. <laughs> there you go. True life found only in Christ. In John chapter 17 and verse 3. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they may know you. Jesus praying to God, this is eternal life, that they may know you, Father, the only true God, 
and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. In Christ. Jesus said in John 20, verse 31, but these have been written. This is John recording about Jesus, but he says, these stories about Christ in my gospel have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ or Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Life in the name of Christ. Romans 6.23 tells us very plainly the wages of sin is what? Death. Yeah. But, the last part of the verse, the free gift of God is eternal life. Where? In, In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Then 2 Timothy 1, verses 8 through 10. Therefore, Paul says, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, efforts, whatever, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the Curing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus, I love that last phrase, Jesus abolished death. He did that by his own death and resurrection. Death was abolished. That spiritual death that separated us from God, that wall was torn down and destroyed. We can have immortality through faith in Christ. You see, our Lord didn't remain in the grave. He is the only way to true life. He is not here, but he's risen. And I want to encourage anyone here this morning who hasn't put their faith in Christ to think carefully about that. You're tempted just like everyone else is in our world to try to find life, as the song says, in all the wrong places. Very tempting. Because, you know, again, we, we, we like to have our pleasures and Maybe there's folks out there who like to deny themselves. That's probably a smaller group than the other. But, but the things attract us. And the rules attract us. There's so many attractive things. But true life is only found in Christ. And I would encourage you this morning to put your faith where it will save you. Where it will provide the resurrection life that, again, will, will enable you to live forever with Christ, with God. Let's... Think about that carefully. If you have a need in life, if you want to talk more about what it means to be in Christ, we can sit down and study what the Bible has to say about that. But if you're at a point in your life right now where you say, yeah, that's what I need. I need to, to repent of a, a life that I've led by my own rules. And I want to confess the name of Jesus as my Savior. And I want to be immersed in the Christ to reenact the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The profession of faith, we can take care of that this morning as we stand and sing.